Good evening. Welcome, gang. We're glad that you have joined us. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 tonight is where we're going to pick off, pick off, pick up, uh, pick off if you're playing football. But yeah, we're going to we're going to pick up tonight, Luke chapter 10, and hopefully we can pick off something to take with us uh, from here tonight. So just sort of uh, as an aside, as we catch the context of what's going on, uh, Jesus uh, has gone up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He's transfigured. Moses and Elijah were there along with Peter, James, and John. And as they have this, this amazing experience up there, you can go back and listen to the last couple of weeks, but as they come down from the mountain after the spiritual high, they run into a demon-possessed boy and his dad, and Jesus casts out those demons, and all the people are amazed. And then Jesus drops this message bomb on his disciples and he says uh, he pulls them away from the crowds who are amazed and he said let these words sink down into your ears for the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men and it says the disciples did not understand that and we talked about last week that they probably didn't understand that because it talks about in the next section in verse 46 that they were having a dispute about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And so Jesus, again, rather than giving them a lecture about how they shouldn't be arguing and what it means to be the greatest in the kingdom, he takes a little child and he says, whoever receives this child receives me. And if you receive me, you receive him who sent me. And we talked about how in that culture, kids, nobody would have considered a, a, a fruitful ministry being ministering to children kids were were until they were useful in the field or to have babies or something they weren't really useful for anything and uh, they were sort of looked down upon and just sort of as a uh, could be looked at as a, as a bother and so jesus says if you if you're willing to minister to the least or go to the least now you're becoming the greatest. That's how you become the greatest is you become the least. And we, Jesus talked about death to self and dying to self. He even demonstrated himself as he left heaven and left his place in heaven and came to earth in order to uh, die for the sin of mankind and to, be, and to rise again on the third day. And so uh, as they continued on, uh, John talks about they ran into this group of people that was uh, also preaching in Jesus' name. And, you know, he wants to know, hey, should we, we stop them from doing that? And Jesus says, no, don't do that. If they're not against you, then they're for you. And then as they continue on into this Samaritan village, the Samaritans, John, uh, Jesus sends some of the disciples ahead, and they don't, they don't, the Samaritans don't want to receive. And John and James, his brother, they get upset about this. And they're like, should we call down fire from heaven on them? And Jesus says, you don't even know what spirit you're of. And you know, we spent a good time talking about that, how God is not reveling in the death of the wicked. He will judge and he will, he will deal with wickedness, but he does, he's not reveling in that. He's not wanting to wipe out the wicked. He's wanting all men to come to salvation and to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus even says there in chapter 9, verse 56, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then he went on with a few encounters about talking about the cost of discipleship. One man says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus essentially tells him, are you sure? I'm, I'm homeless. I don't really have anywhere to lay my head. Do you really want to follow me? And there's another man. He calls him. Hey, you come and follow me. He says, hold on, hold on. Let me go first bury my father. And Jesus says, no, let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. And we talked about how that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't like fathers and doesn't want you to go to a funeral. But in this case, this man was more like saying, let me wait until my father dies and then I'll come and follow you. And Jesus says, no, if I'm calling you, you come now. And then this last guy that he ran into, he, he wanted to go back and say farewell. Have one more round with the boys. Say farewell to the friends and the family. 
And Jesus said, nope, you, you're going to make the choice to follow me. You follow me now. It's a one-way route. You know, there's a, there's a number of songs uh, decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. There's one way, Jesus, right? the, the song from Hillsong years ago. But when you follow Jesus, it is a one-way road. And notice he, he invited the man to, well, first, the, the first guy said, I'll follow you. The second two guys, Jesus said, follow me. Notice there's some, something involved there. We are following him. He's inviting us as Christians to follow him, to become a part of his life, to look to him, to walk with him, to learn from him, but just to follow him. And, and so as we move into chapter 10, that's our context for where we're at. So as we read, uh, well, let's pray before we get into chapter 10. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight just for your word, and we thank you that you have given it to us, that it pertains all things uh, according to life and godliness of the man or woman of God might be thoroughly equipped and lacking nothing. And I pray tonight that through your word you would equip us to be better followers of you, that perhaps if there's someone listening that, that is not a believer, tonight they would hear how you desire to, for people to follow you and that they would make that choice. I pray that in our own hearts and my heart that I would be one who is a follower of you and not trying to blaze my own path and do my own thing. And I pray that you would just uh, fill us with your spirit tonight, that we might hear from you, that we might understand your word, that you would speak to us, and that we would walk away from here tonight knowing you more. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So chapter 10 in Luke. And Luke says, after these things, the things we were just breaking down, the Lord appeared, I'm sorry, not appeared, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. In whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Wow, so Jesus has a lot to say here and some really powerful things to say that we need to consider tonight. And he says, it says, first of all, in verse one, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. And you remember back in chapter nine, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles that he had chosen to go on a mission trip, to go before him, to heal the sick, specifically to cast out demons and to preach the kingdom of God. And that's what they did. But now he's sending out 70 others. So let me just make it clear. Ministry is not exclusive to specific people. Every person is qualified for ministry. Now, there's certain things and certain ministries that Jesus may qualify a person for or give them a specific gifting in order to fulfill that particular ministry, like those disciples, the, the 12 that were sent out. He gave them power to heal the sick, power to cast out demons. Those are very specific things. My ministry doesn't look like that. Now, that doesn't mean that that can't happen, 
if I pray for somebody and they're healed or if there's somebody who's demon possessed and we pray and the demon goes out that that those things can happen but that's not the specifics of ministry like we know it today what's our ministry supposed to be primarily today is go into all nations make disciples and teach them all the things that I've commanded you and Jesus says he'll be with us in that but there's still some great lessons that we can learn so he sends out these 70 other people so not the 12 and he sends them out in pairs, two by two, before his face or to go before him and place where he himself was about to go. So why does he send them out two by two? And I think that that's a question that we, we should be asking ourselves. Does that mean if you're by yourself, you can't ever do ministry or you can't ever share the gospel with somebody? No. But I think as a general rule of thumb, it's a good idea to do ministry in at, in at least pairs. So like if you're going to go out and share the gospel at the mall or you're going to go on a mission trip or you're going to go do some other kind of ministry event, street evangelism, whatever, go in pairs. Well, why? Well, there, I think that you can say the two Ps, right? Number one, prayer. One person might be talking to an individual and the other person can be praying for that interaction while that person's talking. And then the roles might switch. Sometimes, as you're talking in, in those pairs, like there's just a better connection for one person than the other. And they, they maybe they like your face or you look friendly or something. So they want to talk to one person over the other. And that's fine. Then you can just switch the roles. Now I'm praying while you're talking. But then the other thing is protection. I mean, if you get attacked... You got, you got somebody that has your back. And then also protection from false allegations and anything else that can come about. You're better to be in pairs. It, it's just a, it's a good principle that's set out here. Jesus sent them out two by two. And so then he said to them, now still speaking to the 70, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in to his harvest. Now, Jesus says, hey, guys, guess what? I'm sending you out. This is going to be awesome. You're going to go before my face. You're going to tell people about me. You're going to heal the sick and the, tell them about the kingdom of God. And now that I'm sending you out, I want you to do something else. Pray for more people to come out because he says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I don't know if you've ever been around a farming community. Uh, you know, I grew up in Southern California and the community I grew up in, there wasn't much farming going on. There was a few strawberry and bean fields left, but that was about it. Now, in my early 20s, I moved up to Central California and lived there for a little over a year. Now, there's a ton of farming happening in Central California in the, in the valley there. And... One of the things that I was privy to watch happen there was the cotton har crop and harvest. And the, there's these huge fields and the, the cotton crop is planted and then the cotton crop grows. And then when the cotton is ready to be harvested, it just the top of the plant just has this big white puff ball on top of it that, that the, uh, the pickers have to come through and pick all that cotton off and... Uh, then later on, they, they'll send a cotton gin, or it might be the other way, they send the cotton gin through, gets the bulk, and then the pickers come and get what's left. But either which way, there's a lot of people out in that field harvesting that cotton because they've got to get it. Because if rain can ruin the crop, there's all kinds of things that can, bugs and whatever can ruin the crop. So they got to get out there and they have to get it. So they, they get out there quickly and there's a whole bunch of them. So Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. What does that tell me? That means that there's plenty of people who are ripe to come to Jesus. There are plenty of people who need to hear the gospel, who are ready to hear the gospel. I would suggest that in our culture right now, with so much confusion, when you watch the news, I don't even know what to believe anymore. I don't know, well, is, that, is the COVID vaccine good for me? Is it bad for me? Should I take it? Should I not? This thing they're saying about this group, is that true or is it not true? You got totally diabolically opposed 
news reports and political parties. There's nothing that matches. And you go, how can I even know what's true? Even the weathermen, they're always wrong. They don't know if it's going to rain, snow. If it's going to, what? I mean, they say it's going to be a nice sunny day and it rains. It's going to be a rainy day and it's sunny. Like, I mean, they don't, they just, what do I believe? In, in our culture, there's people running around. They don't know what to believe either. Do I believe in Jesus? Do I believe in Buddha? Is everything a God? Should I be a pantheist or a, a, a should I be a Mormon or should I be a, a Catholic or should I be, I mean, people don't know what to believe. They want to know truth. And I would say that the harvest is ripe. If you go out and you want to talk to somebody and you have truth to offer them, people are going to want to hear that. They're going to want to hear truth. Doesn't mean everybody's going to accept it, but it's not always a, a what's the word I'm like an intellectual issue. Sometimes, mostly, it's a moral issue. If I believe the truth of the Bible, then I am not going to want to. Then I'm going to have to give up this sinful lifestyle that I'm living, and I don't want to give that thing up. I would rather go to hell and pretend and believe something else that's not truth. But that doesn't mean that people aren't hungry for truth, that don't want truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. It's that simple. And people need to hear it. People want, I would say people want to hear it. So he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Flip with me back to John. I'm sorry, forward to John chapter 4. And there's a good example of this. John 4. And this is, Jesus has already been ministering to the Samaritan woman at the well. His disciples had gone away to get him food. And then the disciples come back and they're expecting him to want to eat. But he really doesn't want to eat at this moment, but he was hungry when they left to get food. And so the disciples are having a hard time understanding this, and they, they urged him, saying, verse 31, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you don't, do not know. And the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? They're confused. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And I truly believe that what's happening here, because the Samaritan woman has gone away, and she's gone back to her village to tell the men of the village about Jesus, who she just talked to, and that now, in the the next, if we continue reading this section, you see that that the Samaritan men now came out to hear about this Jesus that the Samaritan woman went and told them about. So I believe right now, as he's having this conversation with the disciples, these men are coming out with turbans on their head, and Jesus says, "Look, the harvest is plentiful." The, the field is ripe for the harvest. Look up, lift your eyes, look at the people. They're coming right now. And I think that's true for today. I think it was true then. And I think it's true for these 70 that he sent out that the harvest, the Lord of the harvest sent out laborers into his harvest. But he says, pray for more. Pray for more workers. Why? Because one person can't do it all. 70 people can't do it all. It's a, it's a shame today that more churches churches fight and infight more than they do join together for the furtherance of the kingdom. We, we should be, because we have some non-essential differences with churches down the street, we, we tend to like, well, we're not going to partner with them and do any ministry because they do ministry different than we do. <laughs> There's still a harvest and there's still people that need to come to Jesus and to get saved and to think that we're, we're fighting over these, these non-essential issues and won't go out together to reap the harvest. And so Jesus says, pray. So if he says, pray for more workers to come into the harvest, 
what do we think we should do? We should probably pray for more workers to come into, har into the harvest. Lord Jesus, please send more workers into the harvest. That's simple. And then he says, verse 3, Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Well, there's a great thought, right? Jesus is telling them, hey, I'm sending you out. The harvest is ripe. Here's the ministry I want you to do. Now, you guys get going. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Well, hold on. Lambs among wolves. Let's really think about this for a second. This really sort of jumped off the page at me when I was reading this. I was contemplating that. What does that mean to be a lamb among wolves? Well, simply stated, as my pastor has said for years, sheep eat grass, wolves eat sheep. So if I'm a lamb among wolves, that's not a great thing. It means I'm food. The 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 wolves are going to try to eat me. And so, what is he talking about? I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Why would he send you out as a lamb among a wolf? Are you sending me out to get devoured? To get torn apart? Why, why do I want to go out as a lamb among wolves? So let me ask you some questions about lambs. How do lambs, I wrote a word down in my notes, but it's the wrong word or autocorrect, and it, I was going to say, how do lambs fare? Well, against wolves, they don't fare very well. I don't know what I was trying to say, but let me, let's talk about lambs some more. Lambs are skittish. They're weak. They virtually have no defense mechanism of their own. When they fight, they only fight each other. They run from everything else and become food. Right? How do lambs, lambs, if they get in the predator comes, they one of them usually at least gets caught, gets torn to shreds. Lambs are not, sheep are not the smartest animal on the planet. So how does a lamb, how do sheep stay safe? How do sheep stay fed? How do sheep stay watered, etc.? How does that happen? They have to stay near their shepherd. And Jesus is telling them, I'm sending you out as a lamb among wolves. To me, that means if I'm being sent out as a lamb amongst wolves, then I better be staying close to the shepherd because he is the only one that can protect the herd of sheep. Even if there's a sheep dog, the sheep dog works at the command of the shepherd. If the sheep are getting out of line, the shepherd is the one to correct them. Now flip with me back in your Bible to Psalm 23. It illustrates this very well for us. It says in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So if the Lord is my shepherd, I'm in a good place because I'm not going to want. He makes me, notice he makes me, not I want to, but he makes me lie down in green pastures. So how does a, a lamb get a great place to sleep? He lies down in a green pasture because the shepherd brought him to it. He leads me beside the still waters. How does a lamb get clean, fresh water to drink? The shepherd has to lead him to it. If Again, if you don't know a lot about sheep and lamb, they will find every dirty mud hole to drink out of, but they will ignore the clean water. The shepherd has to take them there. They will lay down in the, in the mud and the sticks and the brambles, but the shepherd has to take them to the green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me. Who leads the sheep on their journey as they travel? It's the shepherd in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, sheep among wolves, I will fear no evil for you, my shepherd, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I forget which one is which, but... The rod or the staff, 
One of them is for grabbing a hold and sort of directing the sheep in the direction you want to go. And the other ones, when they get a little bit out of line, they whack them with it. But it says, they comfort me because I, you're doing it for my safety to keep me safe. Notice this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. A sheep can't anoint its own head with oil. Why do sheep need their heads anointed with oil? No Jeopardy question. Because of flies. Flies will bug them like to death. They will drive them literally mad. So the shepherd will pour oil on the head of the sheep and it keeps the flies away. They don't want to be near the oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So from the perspective of the sheep looking at the shepherd, the conclusion is surely, exclamation point, it's not, surely is not one of the other nouns here, goodness and mercy. Surely is like the, the verb or the adjective or whatever, I forget. But surely now goodness and mercy shall follow me. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. And so how does, how going back to Luke, how does a lamb among wolves stay safe? This is communicating to me that I have to cling to my shepherd. I have to stay close to Jesus as I'm going out, as I'm doing ministry, as I'm trying to be an example in my family and in my job and in my school and everywhere else. I have to stay close to the shepherd. If I don't do that, I get devoured by the wolves. And as a Christian, don't think that, oh, oh I can just be one of the wolves. And then when I come home, I'll... I'll be a lamb again. It doesn't work that way. If you're a Christian, you are different. You are set apart from the world. And the world will devour you if you're not staying close to the shepherd. Things won't make sense. You'll be confused. Life will be harder than it needs to be because you need to stay close to the shepherd. And so now he gives examples for what he wants them to do. This is going to require that they stay close to the shepherd because look, it says, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. So he says, basically, don't take anything with you. You don't need a money bag or a knapsack or, or sandals. Don't greet anybody along the road. You're going to fully trust in me to provide for you. You're going to fully trust God to provide for you. How do, you have, how do you do that? That takes faith. Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I need to, again, back to this line, stay close to the shepherd. And let him provide for you. Because remember, he leads you to still waters. He leads you to green pastures. He anoints your head with oil. Everything you need, he's going to provide for you. But your responsibility is just to don't wander. You know, there's the old song, I forget what the, the song is, but the line goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart now, take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. What is it? I don't think it's that. Shannon sings it's I need thee. If you know what it is, write in. But staying close to the shepherd. So don't take all these things. And then he says this interesting line, greet no one along the road. Well, what, what, I can't say hi to anybody? What, again, this is a cultural thing in this culture, in Eastern culture. It's di much different from our American culture. In our American culture, we can come by, we can high five somebody and keep on going. We can shake a hand and keep on going and just say, hey, hey, what's up, what's up? And it, that's the end of it. But in this Eastern culture, you, you had to come, when you came by a person, like it was like this exuberant, like who can be more hospitable to say hi to each other? It was this long drawn out thing. And that was what was happening and still does to some extent in Eastern culture. It's a very hospitable culture. It's a very uh, 
like friendly. We're going to sit and talk. I can't just say, Hey, got to go. It's I've got to now sit and talk to you for however long you want to talk. But Jesus sent me on a mission. And so the idea here is like, what I'm sending you to do is important. So don't take time to do anything else. It's the same concept he gave to the other guy who wanted to go back and bid farewell to his family. He said, no, follow me right now. Let me go bury my dad. Nope. Let the dead bury their own dead. You follow me. And so this is what he's telling them. Just go do what I'm telling you to do. And he says, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So a couple things here. As a follower of Jesus, I should have peace to give. When I come into my office, when I come into my school, when I come into my house, I should have peace to give. And so that's one thing. Say peace to this house. I can't say peace to this house if I don't have any peace to give. But then it says, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. Rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So this, what I want you to picture is this. This is house-to-house ministry that they're doing. Right? This, is, this is going door-to-door. Right? And to give you a, like an example is in the Philippines on a mission trip a few years back, uh, we did, I've been there a number of times and a couple different times that we've done like door-to-door ministry. And when you go do these door-to-door ministries, you're essentially knocking on the door. Someone's answering and you're essentially saying, hi, peace to this house. Like we want to tell you about Jesus. Are you interested in hearing? Some people say no. Some people say sure. Some people have arguments or they they're, have a different belief. They're Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or something. But, you know, another, another instance, we went and we carried these big pots with us. They were full of a soup called a rose caldo. And we went door to door and knocking on the door saying, Arroz caldo, Arroz caldo. And the people would open the door and they'd have a bowl ready for you to put soup in there. And then you just were simply saying, Jesus loves you. Thank you, Jesus. And then moving on to the next, <laughs> the next house. And I can, I can hear my Filipino friends saying it. That's why I'm giggling because it's thank you, Jesus, you know, uh, with their, their, su- I'll say sweet accent because it is, uh, but it's, it's, you're bringing the peace to the house. But then he says, if he talks about if there's a son of peace there, then your peace will remain. If not, it'll come back to you. Well, what in the heck does that mean? Well, at this time, there really would not be an inn, like we have Holiday Inn or, or uh, Days Inn or something. There wasn't really any place like that to stay. If there was a place like that, typically, it's my understanding that they were places of ill repute. It would be like a house of prostitution or a, a something like that where you could, that's the only reason you would stay there, right? So they had to find a place with a, quote, son of peace. Well, that phrase, son of peace, means someone who is upright, a benevolent host, right? So again, the idea is being out on this door-to-door mission, you're going door-to-door telling people of the kingdom of God. I want you to picture this, Okay. Hi, we're with Jesus and we're here to tell you that he loves you and that, you know, is there anyone sick in the house? Can we pray for them? He told us he sent us out to pray for the sick. And, oh yeah, my, 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 my cousin just broke his leg. Can you pray for him? Or, or so-and-so's got the sniffles. Can you come and pray for them? Right. And you pray for them. Right. So, but then if they're telling you to pound sand, no, but sometimes what would happen again, the hospitable culture as you go knock on the door and you say, hi, we're with Jesus. We're here to pray for you. He's coming. He's going to have a message soon. But while we're here, can we go ahead and pray for somebody in the house? And someone is going to say, why don't you just stay with us? You, you can just lodge with us now. We'll feed you. We'll take care of you. You do your ministry that you have to do, but you can stay with us and we'll, we'll feed you. They want that peace in their house. And a son of peace, if this is an upright person, then someone that's 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 benevolent host then go ahead and stay with them but again i want to jesus went to sinners 
He hung out with sinners, tax collectors, sinners. He, he brought the kingdom of God to them. But when it comes to who am I going to stay with, I don't know that it would be the best idea for somebody who's preaching the kingdom of God to be staying with someone who's a known drug dealer or someone who's a, um, you know, picture this example, and I'm trying not to make this like legalistic thing, but picture you're a male, two males, two men are out on this two by two journey and they come to a house that has two females and they say, oh, we want to host you. Why don't you come and stay with us? How does that look to the community? That's not sending the message that you want to send. Now, so I realize that circumstances are all kind of messed up for people and sometimes you have to do what you have to do, but as best as you can, you want to stay in a place where, where it not only, there may be nothing sinful going on, but we also want, the Bible says, to give no appearance of evil. And, and so this son of peace would be like, you're going to someone's house in that community who is a person who's known to be upright, who wants to host you, and you go in there and you stay there. He says, remain in that same house, eating and drinking such things as notice this, as they give. Who's the they? That's the host. You're going to eat and drink whatever the host puts in front of you. Again, this is like Mission Trips 101. When you go out on a mission trip, you go to foreign countries, and sometimes they have some funky food that you're not used to eating. And thankfully, I've like, for instance, in, in Russia, they have this like gelled fish stuff. It's like fish in jelly. And it, to me, it looks like the most disgusting thing on the planet. But apparently Russian people love it or some Russian people love it. <laughs> thankfully, our hosts were gracious to us and they didn't try to feed us that. But if you're on a mission trip and that's what they're feeding you, then you better eat what the host gives you. Or don't eat at all. But don't take a bite of their food and then throw it in the trash. right? But this is what is being communicated is just be grateful what you give. The shepherd, if you're staying near the shepherd so you don't get eaten up by the wolves, and this is where he's led you to a place of green pasture where you can lie down, a place where you're going to have food on the table and water to drink. He's now led you there. Now eat it, drink it, and sleep there. And he says, uh, the laborer, you who are out doing ministry, you're worthy of that wage. That's, that's like your payment for what you're doing for Jesus. You don't have to feel guilty. And if the person is hospitable, it's a blessing to them to feed you. And, it, and again, they want that peace that you're bringing in their house. So they've invited you in to stay. So take it. Jesus says, stay there in whatever city you enter and they receive you eat such things that are set before you don't be picky don't be going out like acting like god's broken he's not providing for you and going well they gave me that little bit of uh i guess in this culture they wouldn't have a blt but <laughs> but they gave me a, a little bit of lamb and shawarma right and i i'm still hungry so i'm gonna go knocking on doors like Hey, you got any extra food? You got any extra food? Or I don't like what they got over here. You got something different? Like, don't do that. Whatever city you enter, wherever you, they receive you, eat the things that they set before you. Then he says, and heal the sick. Notice the, he gives them that power. I have written over the word heal in my Bible. I have the word power written there. Heal the sick there in that city, in that place that receives you. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is God working through people. And, and the idea of the kingdom or the, yeah, the idea of the kingdom of God is near you can carry the idea that we, as the messengers, have the power of the kingdom of God behind us, and it's come near right here. We've delivered the message of salvation and the gospel, and as a as a show of power that there's some proof in it, as we pray, people are being healed. But this can also mean that Jesus is coming behind us soon and the kingdom of God is near or it's close by. Then he goes on to say, but what happened? The question might come up. What happens if 
if they don't they don't want to they don't want to follow me or they don't want to they don't want to hear the message that I have to say what if they tell me to get lost and get out of town what well, Jesus says verse 10 whatever city you enter and they do not receive you go out into the streets make a public declaration the very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you nevertheless know this that the kingdom of god has come near you but i say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for sodom and gomorrah so jesus says go out into this city if they don't want to receive you go out into the middle of the town go out in the middle of the street and make a spectacle dust hey the dust that is on us we picked it up walking into your town we're wiping it off as a testimony against you and then go on to tell them but no matter what you want to hear the kingdom of god has come near and you know when i see that it reminds me that the results belong to god they're his the kingdom of God has come near. The power in the healing, the presence of God was right there in that place. They brought the peace of God with them into town. And the rejection in this case is not of you, the messenger. The rejection is of God. You remember back in the Old Testament when Samuel the prophet was uh, the judge over Israel and the people began to demand, we want to have a king just like all the other nations. And God and Samuel was so mad and he was so upset that they wanted a king. You're supposed to be separate. You're supposed to have God as your king. What do you mean you want to have a king and to be like everybody else? And God said, Samuel, chillax, bud. It's okay. It's not you that they're rejecting, Samuel. It's me that they're rejecting. And this is the same type of idea. You go in, you have this great message, you're ready to share it, and people don't want to hear. Get out of here with that. No, the kingdom of God has come near you. You rejected God. It's not my fault. It's their rejection. But sometimes we can take it so personal. Oh, they didn't like my message, or they, oh, they didn't... I didn't deliver it right or whatever. It, it's in God's hand. The message is in the power of the word. It's nothing to do with the, the messenger. You can share the gospel with the complete wrong attitude and people can get saved because it's not about you. It's all about the message. You can have a guy who does nothing but stutters his way through it. It might take him a half hour to get a simple message out and people will get saved. Why? Because it's not the messenger. It's the message. It's the power of God in the Word of God. The DNA, so to speak, is in the Word of God. That's where the power is at. We cast the seed, God does the rest. And just remember that the results belong to God, but then Jesus has something to say about it. He says, I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom then for that city, well, you remember Sodom from all the way back in Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah. It was a wicked city. They were doing wickedness all the time. Uh, I, I think it's Ezekiel, maybe, that tells us that, that the biggest problem that Sodom had is that they were lifted up with pride. They were filled with pride. And why would it be more tolerable for Sodom than it would be for this city that they're going to? Well, because Sodom didn't have the literal revelation of Jesus right there. They didn't, the, the Bible was not around for the people of Sodom to study. Now, at that time, Jesus was present. The power of the kingdom of God was there. It was observable. And yet they were still going to reject it. Jesus said it is more tolerable for Sodom because they didn't have the same amount of revelation. As you, as, we, as you do now. And this, this wording here, it's more tolerable. It, it shows that there's some level of judgment at the time of judgment. It's not going to be the same for everybody who is going to hell. There, there seems to be, the Bible seems to indicate 
that there will be levels of judgment based on your level of knowledge. God will be fair. And, you know, when he talks about this this day, in that day, well, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the day of judgment, not the day of the Lord. That's the great tribulation period. But he's talking about the day of judgment. Well, what does that mean? And who's going to be there? The day of judgment, that sounds kind of ominous. Well, uh, if we'll look, number one, we have to keep in mind that God is righteous. Uh, Revelation 16 and Revelation 19, they proclaim that God is righteous and true during the time of the Great Tribulation, which was also a time of judgment on the earth to judge Christ-rejecting people. And all of heaven proclaims your judgments are righteous and true. God is going to do it correctly. His judgments are righteous and they are true. And He's not wrong. If you have a problem with the Bible, if you have a problem with Jesus, if you have a problem with the whatever the Bible communicates, the morality of the Bible, the problem is you. It's not God. God is right and He is always right and He will judge rightly based on what He knows in His eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful perspective. We don't see the whole picture. He does. What you think you know about a person is only a little sliver of the whole picture of their life. God's going to take it all into account and judge righteously. So then you say, this judgment day, well, who's going to be judged? As a believer in Jesus, am I going to be there? Am I going to have to worry about a judgment? Maybe worse than Sodom and, oh my gosh, I have a lot of revelation. What have I done? Calm down. This judgment that is being talked about is not for believers. This judgment is what's called the great white throne judgment. It's referred to in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. I'm going to flip there real quick and just read those. So Revelation chapter 20, if I can get my stuck pages there, verse 11. It says, Then I saw a great white throne and him, Jesus, who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place for them. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, listen, according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So number one question at the great white throne judgment Have you placed your trust in Jesus? And let me just tell you, if you're at the great white throne judgment, you haven't placed your trust in Jesus. But at the great white throne judgment, they're going to open the book of life and they're going to see, is your name written in this book? Nope, I don't see his name. Then they're going to open the other book, apparently, and it's going to have all of the works that you've ever done and you're going to be judged based on your life. It's going to be laid out as a timeline, so to speak, before God and he's going to say, Okay, this level of judgment. But I want you to know that that judgment, the word that is used there, and I didn't write it down, but the word that's used there in the Greek, it speaks of like a legal courtroom type judgment. You committed a murder, you're sentenced to life in prison. God's judgment there is going to be like a courtroom where you're going to be judged according to God's law. You're going to say, well this, 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 and this, guilty, here's the penalty. Believers are also going to be judged, but the judgment is different. It's called, it's a, the word in Greek is called bima, and it means like to be judged according to how well you did in a race. So think Olympics, think platforms, gold, silver, bronze, You're not going to miss out on the ultimate prize of being in eternity with Jesus, but the amount of rewards you get going in is going to be different. That's what you're going to be judged on as a believer. You will not be at the white throne judgment. You will be at the Bema seat judgment. And so, again, think of that one like the Olympics. You can read about the Bema seat judgment, Romans 14.10, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 speak of that judgment. And then <clears throat> verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Sidon, Tyre and Sidon at that judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Who, he who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So again, Jesus reminding them that the message, the rejection is not of you. It's not the missionary they're rejecting. It's me, Jesus, that they're rejecting. And when they're rejecting me, then they're rejecting my father and they're rejecting everything. Or when they reject you, they're rejecting me and my father and everything that that entails. What you do with Jesus is the most important thing because if you reject him, you reject all of heaven. You reject all of what God has to offer. It's an important decision what you do with Jesus. That's the mark of cults. When we talk about cults, right? What do they do with Jesus? If anybody is doing anything with Jesus other than what the Bible teaches, 1 John tells us they have the spirit of Antichrist. They're against God. And so when Jesus says this, and we read it in English, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! And it's like this, like, I don't know if you've ever seen some of the Jesus movies that have been produced over the years, and he's always really angry when he says these woes. But that's not the word. The word in Greek is uai. Uai. That's how it's pronounced. And I had to listen to a guy saying it in Greek a couple of times. But uai. And to me, when I hear that word uai, and this, in the, the meaning of that, it's, it's a primary exclamation of Greek. I mean, Greek, of grief. A primary ex exclamation of grief. So you're not going to be going, whoa, whoa, if you're, if you're, it's a heavy word, but you're not going to be all angry proclaiming these woes. This is an exclamation of grief. And why, it sounds to me like the word why. And I picture it as Jesus saying, why, 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 Chorazin? Why, Bethsaida? Why wouldn't you just listen? Your judgment's going to be worse than that of Tyre and Sidon. Why, why? Right? That's, that's the idea behind the word. Uh, uh, a heartbroken why. Why did this happen? Why, why, you know, like the questions that we ask when we're heartbroken. And remember what it says back in, how, how do I know? It? How can I say that with certainty that Jesus is heartbroken? Well, number one, it's an exclamation of grief. That's what the word means. But what does it say in Luke 9, 56? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. But there is a reality that if you reject Jesus, you're destroying your own life. And ultimately, God will judge you according to your works and hell number one but then whatever the different levels of judgment are i don't know what that means but that's what the bible teaches and jesus says to them well Chorazin, Bethsaida, these are all and and the other one he mentions capernaum these are all areas in the northern part of galilee jesus did so much ministry in these areas he was sharing the kingdom of god he was healing he was preaching in the synagogues he was going around healing all of their sick, casting out all of their demons, and yet there's still people in that area, it sounds like as a whole, who are rejecting. We don't want what you have to say, Jesus. It says, if the mighty works which were done here were done in Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon is a Gentile territory. He's saying, if I went to the Gentile area and I did these works, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I came to you, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and you rejected me. Your judgment is going to be worse. And he's again, why? Later on, we see Jesus standing over Jerusalem weeping because of their rejection of him. 
But then he goes on to say in 15, you Capernaum exalted to heaven. Why? What does that mean? How is Capernaum exalted to heaven? Well, Jesus' ministry was, this, you could say this was like the, uh, the hub of his ministry, Capernaum. He was living there. He was operating out of there. He was coming back and forth through there. And yet they're going to reject too. You're going to be brought down to Hades or brought down to death. He who hears you, hears me, who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Again, they're rejecting Jesus. They're not rejecting you, the, miss the missionary. It may seem and feel like they're rejecting you. You may get the vitriol, but ultimately it's Jesus that they're rejecting. You remember when Jesus met the Apostle Paul on, on his way uh, and he, the bright light shined and then Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, he didn't, I'm not persecuting. Who, who are you, Lord? I'm going, to, I'm going to take out Christians. I don't know who you are. As he persecuted the Christians, he was persecuting Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? And that's what we have to keep in mind. As we continue, verse 17 says, Then the seventy, so they go out, they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now look at verse 9. Did he give them power over the demons? It says to heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. So the, the part about the demons seemed to be like a bonus part of ministry. Right? And sometimes that's what we find that happens. As we step out in faith and we're obedient in one area, the Lord will open up another area. And you're like, wow, that was cool. I was here to do this and this happened too. Right? So, they were able, so they come back, they're marveling. Even the demons are subject to us, but notice where? In your name. In your name. They're not subject to us just because of us. It's because we're submitted to you and we're doing your will and we're out here sharing your word and loving on people and healing the sick and the demons become subject to your name. That's pretty amazing. And it, it reminds me too of the, uh, in the book of Acts, the, the sons of Sceva, Acts chapter 19. And in Acts chapter 19, there's this, these seven sons of Sceva and they see the ministry of Paul and they're, you know, they, they want to be able to cast out demons too. So they encounter a demon-possessed man and the sons of Sceva. They have this proclamation that says, In the name of the God that Paul preaches, we command you to get out of this man. And the demons look at the sons of Sceva and they say, Well, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And the demons attack these guys and send them, tear their clothes off, and they go off and running away. It's kind of a, a humorous story, but the, the message behind it is you can't do the work of Jesus without Jesus. You can fake it. You can try to fake it, but at some point you get caught. you got to have Jesus to do the work of Jesus, to do it in the name of Jesus. And this is what happens. The, the demonic realm become subject because you're doing it in Jesus' name. It's Him. It's not you. It's Him. And then He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now you can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So as we look at that verse, that can be taken out of context in our culture, in our world today. People will take this out of, cult, out of context and say something along the lines of, oh, if you're following Jesus, you can, you can step on snakes and you can do this and you can be a snake handler and you know, scorpions, don't worry about them. That's not what Jesus is communicating. The Bible says, don't tempt the Lord your God. This what he's saying right here, I believe this is for specifically this group of people that he was sending out. I'm giving you this authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now, do we have power over the enemy? Yes, in Jesus' name we do. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But we can't use that blasphemously about everything. 
Can't walk into every situation and go, oh, I, get the, I got Jesus with me. I got the authority to do whatever I want. Remember the disciples that couldn't cast out the demon? Why? Because they weren't praying and fasting. Jesus said this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. We got to make sure we're staying close to him. And, you know, there's times when this might apply. Maybe you're out on a mission trip and you stepped on a snake and it bit you and God just supernaturally protected you from that. Or he gave you some other kind of wisdom that you were supernaturally protected from something. Well, it doesn't mean that you're always, this, this, this was a specific thing for these guys. They were out there at his command. Then he says in verse 20, so they're all excited. Hey, the demons are subject. Jesus says, yeah, I give you authority. These things, you can do these things. You have power over the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But then he says, nevertheless, don't rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice. Why? Because your names are written in heaven. The other gospel says your names are written in the book of life. That's why we should be rejoicing. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Don't rejoice that you have power and authority. Oh, sweet. I got saved. Now I got the power of Jesus. Woo! Don't rejoice over that. Rejoice over what he's done for you, that he died on the cross, that he bore the penalty for your sin, that he rose again, that you can have a relationship with him, that he will be, take part in your life. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. He'll give you power to do things in his name. But rejoice over what he's done for you. Why? Well, it keeps you, number one, in a place of humility. Remember, we learned about in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are poor or destitute in spirit, they can't do anything apart from God. And he said, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Destitute people have nothing to boast over. But a destitute person can rejoice greatly when a kind person does something for them. I picture a destitute, homeless person. And I'm not talking about the guy who's making $20 an hour on the corner saying, well, I need money. I'm talking a genuine poor person struggling, barely making it. And now picture someone pays their rent for a month. They're going to be so grateful that someone paid their rent for a month. Why? Because they had nothing. Now someone did this for me. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. If we stay in that place of humility, realizing that it's God that's done everything, He has saved us, and just the simplicity of, of loving Jesus and loving what He's done for me, makes me now want to go out and do things for him. But if we stay in that place, we realize I've got nothing to offer. I got a big, fat, zero, zilch, nada, nothing to offer. But Jesus comes and he gives me power to do something. And I can rejoice in that because I'm saved, because he's given it to me, because I have power in, in and through him. And it keeps us in this mindset of rejoicing and trusting in Jesus, being a sheep among wolves or a lamb among wolves, knowing that if I don't stay close to my shepherd, I'm getting devoured. And it pushes us back to Jesus. And we should constantly be pushed back to Jesus. And thank God that he is the good shepherd, that when we begin to wander a little bit, he'll grab us with his staff and he'll hook us and try to bring us back in. And if we're being a little playing Hard to, uh, hard to wrangle for one of the hard to wrangle sheep. He might have to whack us with the, with the rod to get us in line to come back with the flock. But whatever the case, stay next to the shepherd. Rejoice that your name is in the book of life, that you belong to him. And whatever he chooses to do through your life, then just praise the Lord. And so let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for this time that you've given us together. And I pray that we would be those people that are not only mission-minded, on mission from you, but that we would be people who are rejoicing that our names are in the book of life, that we are saved, that it is you that gives us power to do anything. And apart from you, as you said, we can do nothing. But if we just abide in the vine, then you'll abide in us and you said we'll bear much fruit. And I pray that would be the case. Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you bless the rest of this week. Bless my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.